uh, nice to see everyone again in physically in a long time. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, making Python projects elegant. Uh, it's also something that I think quite talk works <laughs> that I think talkers will be very concerned about. And it also combines my experience it also combines my experience with uh, machine learning projects and Python over the last few years. Yeah, so uh, as Martin has already introduced, I'm a machine learning engineer at Dyson. I worked here as a JavaScript full stack dev before, and then I first learned Python, I think in 2013, <laughs> when it was like version 2.7, and yeah, I use it uh, on and off ever since. One of my favorite languages. Not sure what's more frustrating, JavaScript or Python sometimes, but still one of my favorite languages. Um, sorry if that I use React instead of Django for fun end. <laughs> but nowadays I use Streamlit too, yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah, I used to be a Unity 3D game programmer that using C Sharp. Yeah. So today the agenda is that I'm going to talk about all the things that can help your projects be more elegant. Elegant in the way that it kind of be easier to maintain, cleaner, and kind of like less frustrating in general. Even though like people usually say that you need this only for production, I kind of beg to disagree. So I also like to implement this for my personal projects, especially if you think that your personal projects is something you're very passionate about and you want to do your projects for a long period of time. And then like once you start adding more and more features, right? This gets more and more important. Yeah, so do consider it even if you even if you are just doing like Python in your personal projects. Yeah. So I'll start with like virtual environments. I think like an anyone who learned Python for the first month, right, you'll definitely hear of this virtual environment. But just in case like maybe some some of us forgot. No, this is a refresher. So a refresher is that uh, without a virtual environment, right, Python will install dependencies to your site, site packages in your base installation. And this will lead to a few problems, as we might have found out by if you change your Python in your OS systems, right, then your computer stop working, your Linux stop working, and I need to actually reinstall the entire Ubuntu. Happened to me a few times. <laughs> yeah, so then we slowly realized that really virtual environments are very important. And then eventually you have multiple Python projects. And then like one is 3.7, 3.8, 3.9. And then you have like random dependencies everywhere. And so like, yeah, that's when you really need a virtual environment. So uh, definitely this is a very, very, very tough issue even for my team. <laughs> for my team, like we debate about this all the time, like whether we use VENV, which is the usual one we normally used in Python. If you don't learn Python through machine learning, you will use this one. If you learn Python through machine learning, you will learn this one. <laughs> yeah, so like, there's really a lot of people supporting both Conda and VNV. I would say that for me, it really depends on the project. Yeah, it really, really depends on the project. There is like pros and cons for both. And actually, I even use both together. Yeah, later I will like explain how you how I even like can, can use both together. But yeah, so there are some projects that use requirements.txt, mostly like web project Django. And you, the cons is that you cannot really decide the Python version unless you use something with PyEnv. So like if you use PyEnv, then you can switch your Python version. But even then, it's not really together with virtual environments. So virtual environments doesn't uh, this VNV, sorry, VNV doesn't decide your Python version. It only decides the dependencies. And it kind of like installs packages to the project directory by default. So by default, you'll need to git ignore the, the packages that the VNV installs to the same directory. And I do find that installation of packages is faster. So you see, even in this table, right, there's like some pros, some cons. Yeah, and then we come to Conda. So Conda, these three things, I guess is kind of like a pros to Conda. Uh, okay, the YAML file is arguable, whether it's better than requirements.txt, not gonna debate that here. But uh, I really like that each Conda environment can have a different Python version, which means that I don't need to 
like go and install PyF and try to like kind of like fight with the Python version with VNV. And then it installs to the conda directory, which I also feel is more flexible. First, I have projects that kind of like share environments together. I have models and some tra model training that actually share conda environments. And kind of like it kind of saves time also to reuse conda environments. So in conda environments, we usually reuse content environments across projects, whereas VNV is really like oh, one project, one VNV. Usually it's like that. And yeah, we find that Conda installation of packages is slower. I won't go into the details here, but if you go and search why is it slower, right? It will because Conda has to retrieve the entire channel. So there's a default channel to Conda, right? And it has to retrieve the entire metadata of every single package in Conda. So over time, Conda gets bigger and bigger, and we keep complaining it's slower. <laughs> yeah, they've been trying to solve these issues, but I think so far that isn't the best answer as of yet. Yeah, so it does indeed slower. Uh, quite technical over here. Can you can research like how to speed up Conda installation issues? Yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to show like the difference between Conda and VN. But whatever you choose, at least you have a virtual environment, right? <laughs> yeah. Good, you definitely have a virtual environment. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really like rooting for any of them. So uh, in our, in my current company, right, we have both. I have uh, another team that uses requirements and my team uses Conda. Yeah, and we kind of like keep all our dependencies in P instead of uh, Conda dependencies because we kind of like want to, we, we came from requirements.txt, so originally the package was from requirements.txt. So if you copy and paste the requirements.txt to everything below PIP, right? Actually, your conda environment is the same. <laughs> You're still installing for PIP. Yeah, and then the best thing about conda, I feel in my opinion, is that I can specify the Python, uh, Python version, Python version, and then you will specify uh, the channel is like where the Packages come from. Is it Conda Forge or is it the default Anaconda channel? Yeah, and so uh, you also create them and activate them in different ways. Uh, not trying to say that VNB is bad just because there's three commands <laughs> over here. But yeah, just an example of how you activate the VNB and Conda. So uh, this this command line skin is quite nice. So Ryan loves this skin. <laughs> I think it's called Starship. Yeah. Anyway, it's good because it actually shows you the environment name. So that's very important to know what environment is being activated right now. So like, it's not just for show, it's not just like colors, but the most important thing is that you know what environment you are in right now. Yeah, at all times. That's the most important takeaway. Uh, yeah, and I also sometimes create conda environments specifying only Python. So. I find in Conda it's very easy for me to do that. I literally just Conda create, which creates an environment, and then I specify the Python version. Now that's, that's something I really like to do if I'm starting a new project from scratch. And I might not even have a, might not even have this yet. Might not even have the environment.yaml. Yeah, and then I like to use Conda to like, kind of like, make sure my version's correct. Yeah. So uh, just now I was saying that we use a mixture of conda and requirements.txt together. Yeah, this is how we kind of do it. So after creating the conda environment, we activate it, and then I will actually pick install requirements inside the conda environment. So in this case, like, your project can still have requirements.txt, but you install it to a conda environment of a specific Python version. Well, I guess like, <laughs> this is how we can kind of mix it together. Not really, uh, not really like found commonly online, but this is one of my favorite tricks. Uh. <coughs> yeah, uh, I use VS Code a lot, also because I used to be a web developer, so I haven't switched to PyCharm. <laughs> but anyway, because I use VS Code, right? My examples are more like in VS Code, we can switch the conda environments and the VNV quite easily. So even if you have VNV, you can switch between the Conda environments also. So it's 
uh, all according to how you choose the interpreter. If I'm not wrong, PyCharm does it a bit automatically for you, but yeah, yeah you say <laughs> you nodding your head means it's correct. I think so, PyCharm is a bit more user friendly in the way, because like VS Code, people will be like, eh, what, what Python is VS Code using? Yeah. But I also find it more flexible uh, because I can switch anytime. So, pros and cons. Okay, so we talk about virtual environments. I think everyone knows it's important already. Then we're talking about uh, one of my favorite topics <laughs> is like testing. Yeah, so, anytime I mention testing, right, there's two reactions. Uh. Usually, people are like either very happy or like very sad. <laughs> yeah, but for testing, right, Mm, really, like after you try being in a few bigger projects, you'll find that it's really very hard to do anything without having proper tests in the long run. In the long run, uh, if your project lasts for one week, okay, fine. <laughs> you can don't write tests. You can delete the project after one week. But really, like if you, even if you start the project very fast and you have no tests, uh, you can iterate very fast. You close a lot of Jira tickets, but then eventually you'll find that you have more and more utilities, more and more scripts. Uh, your project owner comes with a lot of ad hoc projects, uh, ad hoc requests. So as you have more and more ad hoc requests and scripts, right, you start to think like, hey, what, did I, what feature did I have before? And did that feature break? Did my old feature break? And slowly my, my team and also, also me, we realized that yeah, we really need to have the test coverage going. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about some testing. So, uh, some benefits of testing which you might already know. But, yeah, having comprehensive tests makes it easier to refactor. Because without tests, right, people are really scared to touch the code. Yeah, they're like, what if this breaks, what if that breaks? So if you really have tests that can test the important features, at least the important features of your code, right? You know that there's no breaking change. If all the tests pass, if you refactor a bit and you shift the clusters here and there, and the tests still pass, you can be somewhat, maybe not 100% sure, but somewhat sure that your important features are not breaking, unless you have 100% test coverage. But even if you have 100% test coverage, it depends on the quality of the test. Yeah, because like testing, there's a lot of different types of testing, which I will elaborate further. Oh yeah, I also want to mention that tests serve as good documentation. So I know a lot of people like to write doc strings and write many, many, many long, long docs, doc strings. <laughs> but that kind of defeats the purpose of Agile in some way, right? I thought we were trying to move away from documentation and then like, now you want me to add a million lines to my doc strings. <laughs> yeah, so I was thinking like, yeah, tests really serve as documentation, as thought works always say. <laughs> so, uh, the reason why is because like, with very good tests, right, you, you know what important functions there are to a script. We don't test every function in a script, we test like, important functions. So, if you see a function being tested, right, you know that that's, that's kind of like an important function, and you will know the parameters it accepts and what is the expected output and that really does serve as a easier understanding to the code and somewhat of a documentation. Yeah. And so I this is one of my favorite videos. <laughs> Not sure if you saw it. <laughs> yeah. So uh oopsies. Yeah. The amazing umbrella. When I first joined Talkworks, this was one of the first videos one of my friends sent me. <laughs> Yeah, so one of my top work colleagues told me that yeah, it's really like if you don't do integration testing, right? Doesn't matter, your product doesn't work. No matter how much you you need testing, how much you mock, whatever, you still need to have the full blown kind of like pyramid kind of testing, which we will talk about later. The pyramid, yeah. But let's talk about like the unit testing, integration testing, right? That's like automated test. So like, when you talk about manual testing, right, in my mind, it's kind of like this. <laughs> it, when you are like manual testing, uh, every, every part of your program, right, it really becomes like lab work, right? Like you need to like really change each parameter and make sure that your solution is correct. Yeah, so it kind of gives me the impression. And the testing 
I want to mention a bit about the testing pyramid. Uh, it's not a testing talk, but like you can use this to kind of like reflect on your own project. Like how many unit tests do you have? Which, which kind of like you need to have more and more unit testing. You 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 should have more unit testing. So, so that so that you kind of cover the basic functionality of the function itself, like just as a unit. But then. Like, like I said, right, if you just unit test and then integration test, uh, if it fails, right, the product still doesn't work. So you still need integration test. Yeah, so integration test, uh, like kind of like the middle part of the triangle where you test that, so the umbrella, you need to test that both parts are working well together. That's the meaning of integration, like different components of the project is working well together. And end-to-end -end tests are really expensive. They are mostly like, from the start, a uh, test that start from the test that test your program from the start to the end, yeah, like really like a human clicking on your program and how they interact with your program is end to end is more like a human tester but just automated, and we should have less of that because it's ex expensive in terms of it's slow, yeah, and takes uh it's also easy to fail such tests because usually you need to wait and wait for a while for the app to react and then test it and wait for the app to react yeah so that's kind of like the most expensive test end to end so do slideshow. sorry Please, slideshow. oh see slideshow yeah. oops oops sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, after like rambling so much about the benefits of test right we need to find out how can we actually do proper testing in python uh, definitely most people will point towards the unit test package in Python. So it's like the inbuilt unit test package. And that's what uh, most people start with, the inbuilt one. But uh, do they all like to recommend like Py uh, trying out PyTest? <laughs> so PyTest is like kind of, kind of an improvement of unit test. Unit test is inbuilt, right? So if there's a package outside of Python, then it must be better. If not, why are people using it? <laughs> so we need to actually purposely install PyTest, but it's really worth the effort, in my opinion. Uh, it was built to address the shortcomings of unit tests, and there's a lot of features. Even up to today, I'm still learning new things about PyTest every day. And the best thing is that it still can run unit test tests. So if your team refuses to change their test, right, it's fine. You still can run their, their unit test test. <laughs> yeah, that's the cool part about PyTest. I uh, won't go through this very detailedly, but I just want to say that PyTest is really more descriptive in terms of output. Uses Python standard assert. And uh, test doesn't need to be always in a class. So I think un unit test right, is always in a class. and also, uh, yeah, so PyTest, the tests are like one function. They can be in a class also, but it's optional. Yeah, and for PyTest, you can use mocker for mocking dependencies. Later, I'll show an example. I think examples are better. Okay, so what I meant by PyTest uses Python standard assert means that it doesn't have to call, it doesn't have to import special functions, doesn't have to call special functions. Is actually using the assert keyword right from Python itself. This belongs to Python library, which is the assert keyword. So I assert that this function is returning for. And asserting that this returning for, right, uh, I guess it's clear to the reader that this will fail. Because <laughs> f returns 3. Yeah, so this is an example of a test that will fail in PyTest. And so it really fails, right? It really fails. And after it fails, we see this like very colorful output where we assert 3 equal equal 4 and PyTest even tells us that 3 is not equal like 3 and 4 are not the same so that's why there's like a plus 3 minus 4 minus 4 is on the right side and 3 is on the left side so this is kind of like the output that PyTest is giving us this very helpful output for you to kind of like find out why your test is failing yeah you can see the exact uh, exact error that occurred and yeah there's a lot of other information over here good for debugging uh, not important to know for this slide yet yeah 
Okay, so for unit test, right, the classic unit test, yeah, I'm not sure how many of you all tried, but if pi test looks like this, right, which is kind of like cleaner, the classic unit test looks like this, where you are forced to be in the class, and you need to inherit from test case. Yeah, and because you are forced to be in the class and inherit from test case, right, uh, you definitely need to have the self over here because it's a method of a class and then you use the assert equal and assert equal comes comes from the fact that you inherit from test case because you inherit from unit test test case then you need to use the assert equal that comes from unit test so that's very different from pytest which directly uses the python assert yeah so in unit test you need to kind of like go and search the documentation like in, instead of assert equal, there's a lot of other type of assert methods. So you need to be very familiar with the different assert methods in a uh, unit test. Yeah. Okay, this is the uncolorful version. It is because it's the <laughs> unit test output. <laughs> the unit test output uh, black and white. But it's still quite helpful, I must say. It still tells you that 3 not equals to 4 at least. <laughs> but then it's like kind of black and white and it's a bit harder to read, I would say. I think I'm quite biased already, so just ignore my biasness. If you if you love unit tests, just go ahead. At least you have tests, and that's my the point of the talk. Yes. So, uh, wanted to show more differences between pi tests and unit tests. Uh, so I created this like we always use foo for our example function, right? I didn't return bar this time, but I return get 1, get 2, get 3, get 4, which they return 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are the functions. And this is the, f the full is the function that I want to test. And uh, these are the imports. So um, whether we should mock these imports or not is a different topic for a different talk. But just assume that I definitely want to mock these dependencies over here. Okay, so this example is from unit test. Unit test example is when you need to patch. You just use the patch decorator. You use um, all the patch decorators to mock every single dependency previously. So remember that we from elegant utils import get one, get two, get three, get four, all the way to five. So because I want to mock these dependencies, means I don't want to use the real functions. I mock them out. And in unit test looks like this. So this is like million patch decorators. Uh, the decorators is the lines on top of the define function. When you define a function, these are the decorators. And you can specify the return, return value of these mock objects. Yeah, so kind of like unit test usually looks like this. And if you, just now I mentioned that PyTest has mocker, which is a PyTest plugin, right? So we, let's, use, let's use mockers. Because for PyTest, right, you can also use uh, you can also use this. You can also use this for PyTest. But one kind of like a benefit of PyTest, I would say, is that there's a plugin which is I'm going to change the slide. Okay, <laughs> then the there's a you can pass in mocker, but you must install this PyTest plugin called PyTest mod. So if you install PyTest mod, you you have this. Uh, in PyTest, we call it a fi fixture, uh, a fixture. But just imagine it as a parameter given to you. So mocker is given to you as part of Py mm, as part of this plugin. This plugin gives you this mocker kind of object. And so with this mocker, right, you suddenly can patch inside the function like that using mocker, mocker dot patch, mocker dot patch, mocker dot patch. And I guess it's less scary. <laughs> That's scary than all this. The reason why is because for every single decorator that you use on top of the function, right, you need to have the corresponding parameter. The your your arguments over here, right, your parameters need to match your decorators. And even even then, right, I get the order wrong. So like, you see, this is one, two, three, four, five. But when we patch, it's like five, four, three, two, one on upwards. Yeah. So even then, I always get the patching wrong and the parameters are kind of mixed up and the only 
sometimes the only way I can debug this right is that I go and print, I will print the mock object just to check what is it actually mocking. Yeah, because the order matters for this kind of using the mock package. But no, we're using the mocker, then we don't need to bother about uh, passing it as uh, arguments to the test, and we can use the mocker.cache. Uh, this does the exact same thing as the previous slide. Yeah, so because uh, I set the return value to zero, remember I promise you that, I promise you that every one of these functions, they return one, two, three, four, five, right? I promise you that. However, after the patching, right, because I made everything return zero, the result is zero. And trust me, this test will pass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, based on trust today. <laughs> Yeah, you all can reference this. Okay, I think talk a lot about uh, testing and my favorite package was PyTest, right? But now we have a uh, linting. So linting, I don't have a favorite package. <laughs> so I'll just talk about linting in general. So in linting, we definitely always refer to this uh, Python enhancement proposal in Python. So uh, in Python, we have like thousands and thousands of Python enhancement proposal, right? Usually last time proposed by Guido, the creator of Python. But yeah, this is one of the famous one, Pep8. You might have heard it before because it's, it used to be a name of the package that does the linting, but then they rename it to PyCode style. Yeah, but anyway, Pep8 is actually refers to the style convention that uh, they recommend you to follow when you are writing Python code. Uh, <laughs> this is a joke because, like, you know, we always say that in programming we have a tab versus space debate, right? Wow, Pep8 has the answer for this. <laughs> yeah, quite cool, quite cool. They have an answer to a lot of things that we might argue about in at work, but after you see Pep8, right, you will stop all arguments at work. We need to stop arguing in the pull request because the style guide says that and we can follow a style guide. Yeah, so that saves sometimes when you are reviewing pull requests. Yeah. You can just refer your colleagues to this. <laughs> and so uh, I'm just talking about Flake 8 because for my project at work, I usually use Flake 8. But I know there's a lot of other linters out there. So even if you go to VS Code, right, and you try to select a linter, they'll recommend you a million linters which actually Bandit is more of a security thing, but never mind. Then uh, I'll talk about Flake 8 today. Flake 8 combines three different kind of useful packages together. They combine like PyFlix, PyCode style, and the uh, MacTab. Yeah. Uh, it can be enabled in VS Code as a Python linter. Although you need to make sure that you, for, for VS Code, you need to install it to your virtual environment first. And then make sure that the interpreter, just now I mentioned the interpreter, right? The interpreter over here. So in VS Code, if you select interpreter, you will select the virtual environment you are using. So if your virtual environment has, if your virtual environment has Flick 8 inside, then VS Code will automatically report Flick 8 errors to you. And that's uh, true for almost all the linters out there, not just Flick 8. Yeah, so uh, because it combines three useful packages, it checks for PEP8 style. Just now we mentioned PEP8 style, right? So PyCode style checks for PEP8 style. PyFlix checks for unused imports and unused variables, which are quite irritating. <laughs> and yeah, I always don't know which uh, variables are not used, and uh, there's a lot of random imports, especially when you copy code from Jupyter Notebook, right? And then there's, we find there's a million Jupyter Notebook imports that we never used before. <laughs> so yeah, the PyFlix does help me in VS Code to remove such imports. And then there's Matcape script. Uh, this one talks about complexity, but honestly, I, I never use it much in Flake 8. We usually use it as part of Sona, Cube, and other, uh, another code analysis checker, static analysis checker. But anyway, this one uh, kind of checks for the complexity of your code. And I don't think it's enabled by default in Flake 8. So yeah, you just need to enable it yourself. OK, so I have an example of a very, very, very bad <laughs> Python code. 
So there's unused imports, unused arguments, bad function naming, and a million other errors. So let's see what happens when we go through the linter. Oh, booms. <laughs> it's like really scary if you see this in your project. So once you activate uh, the virtual environment that has flipped it, and you go to VS Code, you can select flip it as your linter, and then you will start to see this. All the warnings, which is like mostly complaining about white space, imports, uh, variable is not used, that kind mm. of like complaints. Yeah, it's usually things that we complain in a pull request, but after you use a linter, then you, we can stop arguing over it on the pull request. Uh, yeah, so it's very easy to run it, just like flick it. Dot means like you flick it your entire project. Of obviously, there are ways to ignore some files, but I will not go into the details over here. Okay, so the I think the biggest competitor to flick it now is probably PyLin, I think. So for PyLin, right, there's actually more checks compared to flick it. Uh, PyLin will even check for naming style. It will check for whether you conform to a certain naming style. It will check whether you have a doc string or not. And also, uh, even the, our favorite snake case style in Python, they will check for it. And they even complain about the final new line meaning. Wow. So <laughs> they caught the final new line. Yeah, so you can also consider PyLin if you want to be stricter like a more kind of production ready project, you can consider PyLin, but I think it's very, uh, quite, really quite strict <laughs> and a lot of things to follow. So uh, Flake 8 is quite, quite good also as a starter, I think, for linting. Yeah, I think I said this already. Okay, then we have linting, right? So linting is like, we check all the, linting will, it's like a very, it's like a very caring mother, right? They will just tell you that, oh, you have this error, you have this error, but they don't force you to change. Yeah, so <laughs> if you get what I'm, if you, if you understand what I'm getting at, formatting, right, is like a very angry mother that forces you to change your code immediately. <laughs> so like formatter, right, you just control S and poof, your code is forced to change and conform to a certain standard. Yeah, so it's a very strict Asian mother style, I think. <laughs> Probably the first person that calls it strict Asian mother. But anyway, <laughs> so in Python, I usually use black recently. Yeah, recently been using black. So black, the name, the name black comes from Ford. Yeah, and because Henry Ford used to say this, I think one of his meetings, he said that the car can be any color as long as it's black. Yeah, so <laughs> it's like saying like, you just need to be black, right? So black kind of had this philosophy. You don't need to configure everything. Just let black handle it for you. Like your strict Asian mother that doesn't want you to go out at late night. Yeah, that kind of feeling. So it's a, uh, it, it declares, it declares in this, uh, I think this is his GitHub, I think. Or uh, one of his, one of the pages in black. It even says that it's uncompromising. It tells you straight hand. <laughs> Straight away. <laughs> yeah, so you agree to to give it control, but then you was it says that you save time and energy for important matters. Yeah, and I I really do believe in this because I don't want to like hand format my code. I don't want to add tabs by myself. I don't want to argue whether for space or tabs again, right? <laughs> I don't want to have to kind of uh, decide whether there's two lines in between each function, you know, that kind of nitty-gritty things. So I really let Black decide this kind of nitty-gritty decisions. Okay, then, uh, this one, dedication to my colleague here. <laughs> he, he does feel that Black is a bit too strict because Black has a max line length of uh, 88 characters. So 88 characters, like, I mean, it depends on the project you're working on. So for machine learning projects, right, a lot of the variable names are really very long. And I guess the code's kind of complex to begin with, <laughs> with a lot of like loops and a lot of indentation. So we, we kind of decided to get small leeway for max line length. And my team found it to look a lot nicer for our code. I mean, it depends on the team. Actually, the 
documentation for black recommends around 90. Yeah, so you can experiment with the max line length. Yeah, and I think this is mostly all, this is basically the main thing that you should change in black. And everything else, just leave black to decide. <laughs> Yeah, if not, it defeats the point of using black. So if you really don't want this uh, strict Asian mother black, right, you can consider other <laughs> auto formatters also, definitely. So recently, uh, the most recent one is YAF, I think. Y-A-P-F, which is developed by Google. I think it's gaining popularity also. It's the total opposite of black. It's very configurable. So I guess people did get fed up with the <laughs> Uh, being too strict on them, yeah, and so uh, you can consider this yeah. I, I think it's called yeah. 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 <laughs> yet another Python formatter. Yeah, yet another Python formatter. Yeah, you know we have YAML, yet, yet another yeah, mark, mark markup language. Yeah, yet another markup language is YAML. And yeah, this is yet another Python formatter, which is kind of true. It's one of the latest formatters in the market. And even though it's developed by Google, right, they do have uh, a few different styles. I believe they have Google and Facebook style. And Facebook is quite close to black, based on my investigation. Yeah, and so you can actually read articles which compare the formatter for you if you want to evaluate which one is better for your project. Yeah, uh, AutoPep 8, I don't really want to talk much about it because it's really just confirmed to PEP 8. It's, it costs auto pep 8 because it just automatically tries to format your code to suit pep 8, but nothing uh, extra. Yeah. Okay, and this is one of the last parts of this talk. We talk about type hints. So, yeah, Python is uh, traditionally also a language that doesn't really uh, focus a lot on types. In fact, when I first learned Python, right, I didn't even know the different types of variables. <laughs> Sometimes when we learn Python, it's like that. We just go along with the flow. But then, right, of course, uh, projects in production, right, or like projects that you want to maintain for a long time, uh, after a while, you might forget what is the type of this variable and stuff. And so uh, this type hint is a new feature in Python, I think relatively new feature in Python, which kind of like can hint to you the type of the variable. Yeah, but I must say that it's really just a hint. So Python does not force it on you to have these type, uh, type hints. And also, even if your type hint is wrong, right, there's, you still can run the code. Python will never want tell you that the type hint is wrong unless you use a, a static analysis checker like MyPy. Yeah, so my, MyPy is kind of like one of the static analyzers that actually check for the uh, re check whether your type hint is correct or not. But normally, you wouldn't know whether your type hint is correct or not. <laughs> yeah. So it really like kind of like something like a dog string, but yet still readable by static analyzers. Yeah. So uh, I think the, even the developers of Python, they are quite worried about uh, like people will start to worry whether we need to keep putting types everywhere in Python. And so they emphasize that Python is still a dynamically typed language. So they have no desire to make it mandatory. Yeah. Um, <coughs> sorry, but another benefit of yeah. having type hints in you know, your uh, mm. parameters and with the function returns and such is um, the IDE. Oh, know, yeah. My charm and uh, I don't know if this code is also when you're trying to call that function, it and, and you pass the wrong type that it's, or that the parameter or the return uh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. It will like highlight it for you and tell you, oh, you're sending the wrong type over there because mm, we got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. So it really gives back control to the IDE, right? No more like it helps the ID to help you, yeah, help the ID to help you, <laughs> because for the IDE, right? It, uh, it cannot guess what type you are trying to create with the variable name. And so, yeah, you are right that giving the type hint will also hint to the IDE what, how shall I help you by... Uh, so, like, just give an example. If I assign the type hint of pd.dataframe, the pandas data frame to a certain variable, then when I take the variable name and I 
add a dot, right, the ID will give all the suggestions for the data frame method, uh, for the data frame object. Like, it will give the suggestions of the method. Yeah. So, uh, after we know, like, it's very beneficial, right, even for the ID and static analysis, and also for yourself, uh, just want to say, like, type hints, right, they look quite different across the Python versions. So before uh, 3.9, I think Python is 3.11 beta now, uh, normally 3.10. But before 3.9, starting from 3.7, we usually use a uh, tap. We will import tuple, tuple list and dictionary. We'll import the type hint like that from the typing library. So everything we need to import from typing library, which Reminds me a bit of TypeScript. <laughs> I use a bit of TypeScript and it looks um, kind of like TypeScript. But then, after a while, after a while, this kind of get annoying, right? Like, why do I need to import something specially for my types? And then, and then, like, uh, Python did allow you to use the lowercase version. Lowercase version, actually, if you remember, it's actually a constructor. So if you use the lowercase version, you can create a new tuple. The float constructor, right, you can create a new float. So actually, these are kind of like normal functions that we used to call, but now you can use them in type hints. But in uh, 3.7, right, you still have to, from future, import annotation. And later I'll elaborate what that weird import is. But there is a way to kind of like use the lowercase version and you don't need to import from typing library. Uh, yeah, this related to another uh, Python proposal, Python enhancement proposal. <coughs> yeah, so, so the difference is that uh, for 3.7, either you need to import from typing library or you do this, which you also still need to import annotations from future. Yeah, so no good way around it in 3.7. And so, if you don't, if you don't do the from future import annotations in 3.7, you will actually get a real error. So when you try to run the code, uh, I help everyone and I ran the code, and so I get this error. A uh, type object is not subscriptable. Very mysterious sounding error. <laughs> it's just saying that because tuple, right? Remember, it used to be a constructor where we can create new tuples. So we are not supposed to subscribe. Subscribe it means like kind of like you know in a list we can subscribe it and say we want the zero index of a list using the square bracket. So subscribing is actually like using these square brackets to subscribe the tuple. So it's as if like they think that you are using this tuple method, uh, this tuple function, they think you are using it like a list because you have these square brackets. And that's why this error occurs because they are actually running the type hints. In this case, the type hints are actually getting run as code. And so, right, and so, right, the why this works, right, later I will explain again. But just, just know that this one, the error is because they really ran the type hint as a code. Okay, so in 3.9, in 3.9, finally we don't need to import that thing from the future, or that import annotations from future, and we can use this for officially. Yeah, we can use this officially in uh, 3.9. And so if you click the typing documentation in Python, right, changing the version from 3.7, 3.8 to 3.9, right, all the examples will change. Yeah, that's why <laughs> you see tutorials, like, they are flipping, like, loti plata from one version to another, and yeah, that's because, like, really different Python version will look different from these type hints, and I guess that makes type hints a bit unpopular, because people are so confused by it, right? That's a bit sad, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you feel affected, right? Like, yeah. Oh no, um, okay. it's super easy once, once you get it, but I wanted to ask if anybody yeah. has used um, Hypins in 3.10 and 3.11, I guess it supports generics now. Do you know about that? 
Like in, in Java, you can have like class hierarchy. Uh, yeah. I think in the past generic, they yeah. T, the yeah. generic T thing. You had like multiple <laughs> types. There was a problem where you had this huge list of types that get, you know, could be a parameter or your return value. But now like you can use generics to be like a short statement that will include like everything in that, you know. Oh, is it in 3.10? Uh, yeah. 3.10 or 3.11. Oh, cool, cool. Sounds cool. Yeah, I remember the generics from Java. <laughs> so uh, you can set the parameter as T, and it can be any type, kind of like. Mm -hmm. It can be like any, it's a generic type. Yeah. It could be like a boundary. Could be like, like, yeah. Class yeah, you could set it as a boundary. Doesn't mean it has to be every type, but it's more like a range of types, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Okay. Maybe how many yeah. more slides do you have? Uh, I think I'm. Almost done. Oh, conclusion. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, almost done. So, uh, just now the, just now why we need to import this future, right? It's because they were evaluating this thing as code in three point seven. So if let's say, if let's say we don't want to evaluate it as code, right? Means that Python need to treat the pipe he, uh, type hints like strings, right? By right. Type string, uh, type strings, type hints, the right type hints, right, can be treated like strings because they shouldn't be code that we run. Yeah, so that's actually the, that's actually the meaning of importing the, sorry, importing the field, importing annotations from future, right, means that we are actually converting the type hints to, to let Python treat it like a string. So it doesn't run it as code. And so it's actually mentioned over here. Uh, it's mentioned in this PEP like 563 and uh, normally when you create a class right and you try to reference the type hint of the same class so vector wants to return a vector object right and so you really don't want Python to run this type hint as code because then Python will complain they'll say like if I, vector's not defined, yeah, it's not defined because like it's kind of a recursive kind of definition. Vector to define vector, it wants to return vector, and vector has not been defined. <laughs> yeah, and so the this from future import annotations help with that by treating the type hints as a string, and you can do this. It will stop trying to evaluate whether vector exists or not. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> the conclusion is that I have gone through a lot of the tools that I use in my daily life with Python for the past few years. And I have only scratched the surface and maybe some of it is a bit too too much for y'all today, but I hope that y'all will uh, get some inspiration and do some, can, you can read about it online. And there's also one more thing I want to mention that everything that I talk about here, right, it cannot be properly implemented in a project unless you have kind of like a continuous integration pipeline. Yeah. <laughs> no, you need to always manually run it yourself with, before every commit, and that's like torture. So, okay, you should always run it before you commit, but also like in case you never run it, or like in case the way you run it on your environment is wrong, so there is still this uh, CI pipeline to catch to catch for such cases and uh, yeah this uh, content for another talk yeah so oh, thank you thank you all right thank you very much i think we don't have enough time for questions and uh, there <laughs> yeah. will be thousands of questions because you showed so many <laughs> yeah. different tools right so um hui fang i would say set up your laptop and let's just uh, jump right into the next talk <laughs>